Hi everyone, it's me, Professor Willis. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about your first official lab, and it's all on evolutionary history and classification. So let's go ahead and get started. As you probably know, this semester's course is all online. So it's really gonna require you to have some technological skills and some basic sets of troubleshooting skills if something occurs and goes wrong. And I really need you to try and practice this um, so that everything goes smoothly in the course. So if you think the link to an activity does not work, I need you to try the following before you email me. I usually go and I check the links before I assign things. So don't automatically assume that there's an error. <laughs> Number one, try a different browser. If you're on Chrome, go ahead and open that link up in Safari or Firefox or even Internet Explorer if people even still have that. Also, instead of just clicking on links, try copying and pasting the link into a browser. Sometimes that helps. If all else fails, restart your computer, maybe do some updates with your browsers because they might be old. And then lastly, always go ahead and try it on your phone. Please do these things before you even think about emailing me and saying the link or the lab doesn't work, okay? So if you can do these things before you email me, that will um, make it a lot easier and smooth running in this course. So that leads us to our first lab. So are you ready to learn about some content before I let you go do your online lab? <laughs> so lab one focuses on classification, so how we name things in nature, and evolutionary history. Okay, so the lab objectives in this online lab is to construct a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram, same sort of thing, and um, you're going to make these trees based on evolutionary information that you're actually going to research using the computer. Um, I also want to introduce you to taxonomy, which is the science of naming species. And then lastly, you're going to see how things get grouped together based upon their evolutionary history. All right, one of the first things that you should know about classification is the person who sort of created the whole system. Um, his name is Carolus Linnaeus, or sometimes you'll see it as Carl Linnaeus or Carl von Linne. It, they're all the same person. He was a Swedish taxonomer, and he pretty much invented this system called binomial nomenclature, which is how we name species. Um, one of the things that he did was created this hierarchy. So if you take a look at the image there, you will see that things are lumped in groups. Okay, and when you start at the top, that's the biggest group. So the kingdom is the biggest group that contains the most species. Okay, um, when you put a whole bunch of phylums together, you make a kingdom and a group of classes is a phylum and it works all the way down to the bottom. So species is the smallest. Okay, and of course, when you put a group of species together, you get a genus and it goes up that way. Now, every single organism has their own classification. And a way to remember how this works is through a lovely mnemonic. So you can remember King Philip came over for good spaghetti. And the initials of that whole phrase spells out the hierarchy system of classifying organisms. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, it's the same thing as King Philip came over for good spaghetti, okay? Um, if you've ever wanted to know how a certain species is organized, I know your teachers always tell you don't go on Wikipedia, but it actually is pretty good um, in figuring out information for different species. So here if you take the giant panda, for example, and on Wikipedia, I just took this from Wikipedia, I screenshotted it, 
um, you can see it tells you what kingdom it's in, what's phylum, class, order, family, genus, and the species name. And again, every organism has their own unique species name. Okay. Um, take a look. The same thing. I just said spider monkey. So you can see Simia paniscus, this one. Um, also has its own unique species name. And then you can see it's in the animal kingdom. It's in the chordates. That's the phylum with backbones. It's in the mammal class. Okay, so all of these um, denote how it is classified as an organism. So taxonomy is the practice and science of classifying. So if you're a taxonomer, that is what you do. You take organisms and you classify them. Now, how do they classify them? We'll get to that in a second. But um, just note that that same system that Linnaeus created is used today. So every organism, again, has their own unique uh, organization. And then lastly, I want you to also remember that taxonomy, um, the things don't always stay the same. So as new information comes out, new evidence comes out, the organisms can be reclassified into different groups based upon what is found out about the species. All right, so the, the idea behind making these, what you see here, cladograms or phylogenetic trees, as it's called, is you take similar organisms and you put them together in what are called clades. So things that are similar are closer together on the trees or the cladograms. Okay, so if you take a look here at these organisms, again, the organisms that are close together are the ones that are usually the most similar. So that is a key rule to remember. Also, um, sometimes you'll see traits and trees like this. And this is unique because these trees actually show the traits that the organisms have in common. So for example, on the far right here, you can see leopard, and then you see the trait below it, hair. And that means any organism above hair has it. So for example, the leopard on this tree has hair, but all these other organisms do not. So that's why you put the trait above there. Um, the next one below is amniotic egg. So again, the only two organisms that have an amniotic egg on this picture is the turtle and the leopard, okay, because of the placement of the trait. All the rest, the salamander, tuna, lamprey, and lancelet, do not have an amniotic egg. Okay, so what are those traits called? They're called shared derived traits, and they are traits that organisms share and have in common. We also call them synapomorphies. So synapomorphies are the same things as shared derived traits. These are traits that organisms share, usually due to common ancestry. So that's where we're getting into the evolution talk here. Okay, so Again, this goes back to the question, right? How do scientists know who is more closely related? So what information are they using to make these evolutionary trees so that we can figure out who is more closely related to whom just by looking at the tree? Well, there's three main pieces of information. Number one, we have our fossils. So scientists, they're digging up fossils. They look at the bone structures of those fossils to see do the bones look similar to other organisms. And if they do, they're probably closely related. They also look for transitional fossils. So things or transitional bones, um, bones that can be found in different species across time. So they can kind of figure out who came first and where that species went. Um, another piece of organ or information that scientists use are embryos. So this, this idea of embryology um, is used, and that is scientists, they look at embryos of different organisms, and then from that, they can determine who is more closely related to whom simply based on the structures that they possess. Okay. And then the last thing, the one that's going to revolve around your lab tonight, is um, molecular evidence. So scientists look at DNA or protein sequencing, because ultimately proteins just do come from DNA sequence. They look at those sequences between species. 
Okay, so they'll look at the specific, like how many A's, how many T's, how many C's, how many G's. If you remember those nitrogen base pairs from DNA, they'll look and compare the sequences across species. So then what scientists do is once they identify a gene that they want to look at, that both species have, they can then count the number of differences between species. And the idea is, again, that if they don't have a lot of differences between the two species when you're looking at their DNA, then you can infer that they probably shared a common ancestor not so long ago and that they're more closely related when we're talking about evolution and how things change over time. But if you go and you count a lot of differences between the two species in their DNA, then that means they probably didn't have a common ancestor so recently, so maybe it was a lot farther off. And when you go to put them on their evolutionary tree, you're gonna put them far away because they aren't so similar based upon their DNA that you analyzed. And so that's kind of how DNA sequencing works. The more closely they are related, they'll probably have less differences in their DNA than organisms that are not. Your first lab in this class is called Evolution Evidence with Amino Acid Sequences. And what you will all be doing using the computer is you're going to be using a specific amino acid sequence called the COX-1 gene, and you're going to be looking at it in a human, in a chim chimpanzee, a gorilla, and a Neanderthal. And this website called Uniprot will actually take the sequences and compare them for you. So you can see how closely the DNA sequence resembles another DNA sequence of a different organism. So it's really cool because they will determine how many differences and calculate a percent identity to the other organisms. With this data, obviously you're gonna write it down in your lab report. Then you're going to go ahead and construct a cladogram. So you're going to actually draw who is more closely related to whom. And remember, follow those rules with the cladograms. If the organism is closely related, then it will have a very high identity number. Meaning, for example, if you find that the human and the Neanderthal are 99.9% .9 the same, then you're gonna put them really closely together on your cladogram. There's also two analysis questions at the end of the lab that you should answer using complete sentences. And I remind you to also practice academic honesty. These should be your own original thought and they should not be coming from the internet. So no copying and pasting information that you see online. If Turnitin picks up um, some plagiarism hits, you'll receive a zero for the lab. The last thing, because I, I did this lab last semester for the first time, because it was online. Um, if you need to like delete the tables and add your own, that is totally fine. If you want to draw your cladograms on a separate sheet of paper, take a picture and insert it into the document, that is fine. If you wanna print out the document and then write on it and take pictures and submit that to um, Blackboard, that is totally fine as well. I really don't care how you get the work done as long as you get the work done and you answer the things that you need to answer on that lab. So just make sure you're going through the lab, reading each step carefully and do exactly what is said on the lab. Make sure you answer any questions, you construct any diagrams that is being asked, and of course, make sure you submit it to Blackboard by Monday at 5.30 p.m. This goes for any Bio 103 section that you are in for my class. So the assignments are given on Monday and they're due the following Monday. If you have any specific questions about the lab, um, you can email me, just try to be specific in your questioning so I know what you are referring to. All right, everyone, so with that, good luck on your first lab. Read the directions, follow it word for word, and submit to Blackboard on Monday at 5.30.
All right, I will see you all later. Bye.